everyone. How many of you are here for the first time? Yo, whoa! First time, that's amazing. Welcome to Creative Morning Charlotte. It's so great to have you here. favorite things is to bring up a Charlotte musician. Mirabelle and I were walking uptown, and I heard this amazing music playing. It was Von Hunter. He was just playing on the sidewalk. And I walked up to him and I said, you're great. Do you want to play Creative Mornings? And he said, yes, I do want to play Creative Mornings. So ladies and gentlemen, welcome Von Hunter. part of a glo growing global community. There are 141 chapters around the world. We are chapter 123. One of the new traditions we're trying to do is actually like reach out to our fellow chapters around the world and give each other messages. And so um, we did one to Perth last time, right? We did one to Perth? Yes. And so this is their reply to us. Here we go. Hey, thanks so much for the video message. We've just got one back for you guys. Oh my god, that was amazing. <laughs> From Australia to you guys. There you go. All right. So today we're going to do one to Taipei. OK, here we go. Ready? One, two. Hey, Taipei, have a creative morning. Hey, from Charlotte. Yes. I've been practicing that. I need three people who want to play a game and win some prizes. We got one right there. We have one right here. One more, one more, one more. We got one right there. OK, come. What's your name? Anna. OK, Anna. And tell the crowd what you do. I work for Playing for Others. Ooh, Playing for Others. We love Playing for Others. Thank you, Anna. What is your name? Noel. Noel, what do you do? I am the Tech Yoda. The Tech Yoda. Yes. May the fourth be with you. And what is your name? Katie. Katie, what do you do? I'm in marketing at Crescent Communities. At Crescent Communities. All right, awesome. Well, thank you for playing. We're going to present three headlines to you, and you have to guess which one actually happened. These are all Charlotte, Charlotte stories, OK? Here we go. Rhinestones and Crystal, Concord Mills Western Store cooking up meth. Crook in Batman costume robs bank in Batcave. 
Back in North Carolina, if anybody knows what referring to. International Sandwich Festival vendors banned from cutting cheese. What really happened? This is a really tough decision, but I'm going to go with one. You're good. Yes, in March, a drug investigation resulted in the arrest of 26 people, including the manager of the RCC Western store in Concord Mills, where she and friends regularly cooked meth inside the store after the mall closed. I know. Come on, guys. This is reality, OK? This is reality here. Wake up. Panthers, the lair, the nearly decapitated. Jamaican me naked, overbooking leads to underdressing at Charlotte Douglas. Or B of A bigwigs warn hair restoration company there will be hell to pay. <laughs> What's the real story? Oh, man, I think it's Jamaica me naked. <laughs> I'll, I'll get off of this real soon. <laughs> Already stated that, quote, while the man may have been disrobing for some time, <laughs> officers responded within minutes of having been notified. So. And finally, North Charlotte neighbors nauseated that next door nakedness is not a no-no. Marijuana issues sent to Charmec City County Joint Committee. <laughs> or struggling Charlotte Dennis tells Barack he's Baroque. Is it possible that all of them are true? No, no, okay. but, but, so no. <laughs> this is a tough one. I'm gonna go number one. In the theme so of nakedness. What's going on with all the nakedness in Charlotte? <laughs> Last March, residents in Cardinal Glen neighborhood in North Charlotte went to the press saying that one of their neighbors stands in front of the door of his home naked and he's been doing it for nearly 10 years. <laughs> one neighbor was quoted as saying, I was rolling out the trash can on Friday and I just happened to look over and there he was standing there buck naked again. So what is going on with all the nakedness in Charlotte? That's what I want to know. All right, you're all winners. Let me give you your prizes. There are lots of goodies here from out of print, so I'm just going to hand these out. It's like, it's amazing stuff. It pays off to raise your hand and say you want to play the game. And I do have two screen printing t-shirts from AIGA from their most recent workshop. Yay! Okay. All right, thanks, guys. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Dr. Susan Cernak Spatz. She was born in Vienna in 1922. It's such an honor to have her here, guys. It is such an honor to have her here. She was born in Vienna in 1922. In the following 23 years, she experienced many of the terrors of her fellow European Jews. Early Nazi oppression in, in Berlin, Nazi-occupied Prague, deportation, and ultimately, in January 1943, the true horrors that awaited her in Birkenau, the women's camp in Auschwitz, where she survived her two-year internment. These months of hell were followed by a death march of incarceration in Ravensbrück, from which she and a group of fellow inmates walked away to freedom. After the liberation, she worked for American counterintelligence and for the British military government, both as an interpreter. She was reunited with her father in August 1945 in Brussels. She married an American GI and came to America on July 4th, 1946. She's been a languages professor, a celebrated actress. She has three children, and she's active in, still active in the field of Holocaust studies, including delivering yearly lectures in Germany for over a decade. It is quite a distinguished honor to have truly one of the remaining Holocaust. I mean, she's, she's going to be here with us today telling us her story. And she's a creative person in her own right. I mean, how many of you saw that amazing photograph of her as a, as a young ballet dancer? Just, just incredible. Anyway. It is my distinct pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Susan Spatz. I feel very honored that you had asked me to speak to you. Because usually I speak to children, to college kids, to high school kids. But I think it is just as important that I speak to you too, because we all have a tendency to forget the past. And I cannot allow the past that I've had to, to be forgotten. Because if we forget that one, we're bound to repeat it. I think Matt probably gave you the background of my beginnings. In 1938, actually, that's when it started for me, what we'll call the Holocaust driver. 
In 1938, when the Nazis marched into, into Vienna, with a suitcase in hand, we left Vienna and went to Prague. Unfortunately, because we had a branch of our business in Prague, that's why we went to Prague instead of going west. In 1939, Hitler followed us into Prague, and my father decided that was it, he was leaving. Unfortunately, my mother, who, my father was a bit of a hand-packed husband, and when mother said, the child and I will follow if you su to succeed to get across, across the border, mother, my father said yes, and he went. And we were left literally in the trap. And from that time on, I think I would like to give you an outline of, I don't know if you remember in old films when the calendar leaves would, would f fall down. May I do that in years? In 1939, my father left. In 1941, Hitler decided on the beginnings of the extermination the so-called final solution, and the first uh, transports from Austria and from Germany went into Poland. In 1941, they decided, in, in, when I lived in Prague, they decided the, the Czech Jews should be deported into a ghetto because actually it was a ghetto that the Germans needed to show the free world how marvelous they treated all the Jews in the world in a town of 35,000 people. And like I always said, either the world was so stupid, the free world was so stupid or so indifferent that they believed it. And I can't think the whole world was stupid, so they were just indifferent, just Jews. So in 1942, my mother and I were deported to Theresienstadt, which was the show ghetto that Hitler had established in, in the Czech area that there was the first selection, and I get to the word selection, you might have heard the word of selection about Birkenau. The selection was going east or staying in Theresienstadt. My mother and I were, were uh, offered to stay in Theresienstadt, but her, her friend, her partner, couldn't stay there. So my mother said, we all leave. And I said for the first time in my life, no. My mother, left for what I found out later, Sobibor, one of the extermination camps. I stayed in Theresienstadt until 19, January 1943, when among other thousands of others, I was deported to Auschwitz-Birkenau. We knew the word Auschwitz, and it was one of the many concentration camps, but nobody knew the word Birkenau. And Birkenau was the so, I think there was a book once written about five chimneys. It was the, the place of extermination only, but not extermination altogether, because if I would have gotten into any other of the extermination camps, I wouldn't be alive. But Birkenau was a labor and extermination camp because the Germans were short of labor and needed the labor of the people before they were, uh, before they were gassed. So I came into Birkenau in 1943, I went through Birkenau through the entire range of outside commando, working inside in an office, and ended up in what was known as Canada. Canada was not the, Can the place of, of uh, North America, of course. But let me, let me re retreat. I worked first in the administration as a sort of registering everybody that came into the camp and into the camp only came a very selected few. My number is 34,042. They started tattooing our numbers in, at 34,000, and 62 came into the camp. And when, when we left, I think there were about four or five left. Anyway, we came into the camp, we went through the, in, in the so-called outside commando, which was the, I would say deathly commando, because you worked out in the fields, you had never changed your clothes, and never had an, an opportunity to get some extra food. And the one thing one had to learn is if you wanted to live, you had to learn how to find somebody inside the camp who would help you get out of the outside. It was the obligation of the people inside 
to help a person if uh, she was approached to get inside the camp because on the outside commando you did, never lived longer than two months. I was very fortunate to get in finding a uh, connection and came inside the camp and worked in the uh, in the administration for about not very long because I, I, I wrote the names of the few people that were selected out of each transport into the so-called big book. And when the administrator of the, of the office, the highest Jewish prisoner in camp, saw my handwriting, she absolutely threw up her hands in disgust and transferred me. And there again, the unwritten law helped because you could not be transferred out of to, to the outside commandos again. You could stay, you stayed inside the uh, camp, wherever you were transferred to. I was transferred to the construction commando, where I typed uh, specs for camps from the Silesian border to the Ural, practically, for all of the, of the Europeans, except the British and the Scandinavians, who were probably Aryan enough. And I got sick while I was in the construction commando, and by that time, my number, 34,042, was a low number. Low numbers meant survival. Nobody, even at the Holocaust Museum to this day, do they not know why this low number gave you uh, respect. Maybe it's a, the mere respect that we survived that long. And so my number was low. I was, when I was in the hospital, I had my own bed and I didn't have to stand in roll call. And I came out of it and was transferred into the Canada Commando. And at the Canada Commando, this was the elite commando of the camp because there all the clothing that came in on transport, all the food, all the valuables that came in on transport were sorted in the Canada Commando and bundled and sorted out and sent to Germany. As a matter of fact, any time a transport came in, in uh, freight, freight cars, the freight cars would be unloaded, that they would be cleaned, and then the next day we would load them with the clothing that was sent into Germany. So, and in Canada, I, w I worked in the office as a, as a secretary, and the interesting thing was that when I was assigned to Canada, I, I stood in line and the SS man in front looked at me and he said, ah, oh, the office help is here, you're going to Canada. Which was very, very lucky because it helped. The 500 people in the Canada Commando had the one exclusive thing, which I suppose, I don't know how to explain it. We had one SS man who was the head of the commando who I don't know what he did or how horrible he was before he was in, in, in Canada, but he saved 500 people on the death march when we were deported in January of 1945 by coming into our, our uh, sleeping rooms. In the, there were two, blo two, blo two blocks of, of women's, uh, women and three blocks of men in the Canada camp because we were separated. They didn't want the, the rest of the, of the uh, camps to get too much smuggled stuff in from, from what we, we, of course, we smuggled into, into the camps for, for our clothing, for our friends. The most interesting thing was that, that with the best, uh, how shall I say, the highest paid items that we brought in were bras. <laughs> because the Germans didn't give you any bras when you, when you get, came into the camp and put, were put into the camp clothing. I've never figured out punishment, whatever, I don't know. <laughs> but bras were very highly paid. And of course, but we, we would smuggle all we could when we came, while we were in the camp still. And that was the reason that we were put into a separate camp. And on January 17th, that night, the head of our command, the man, by, the man of, by the name of Werner Hahn, who came, came into all the blocks, men and women, and said, people, go into the, the warehouses, that, about 20 warehouses in the back there, in the Canada uh, camp, take all the heavy clothes that you can put on, good shoes, get a knapsack with, with, with extra clothing, with extra underwear, 
we're going on a long walk. And a long walk it was on January 18th, actually, because today we celebrate the liberation of Auschwitz on January 28th, which the Rus Russians arranged with a camera, com a TV commander, camera, all arranged, bringing into the camp, liberating the camp. We were out on January 18th. Auschwitz was deported, except for the people in the, in the hospitals. And on January 18th, those of us, those 500 of us, we were, we were marching through the woods with knee-high snow. And those 500 of us survived, whereas the roads along the, the, the through the, where we walked, walked through, were lined with corpses, people who did not have enough shoes, people who didn't have enough clothes. They died by the hundreds, I would say. We came to a little railroad station. There was a long train with freight cars and open coal cars, because by that time the Germans knew they had lost the war, but they were not going to lose one Jew if they could help it. And so they didn't know what, how, what, to, what whatever they had to use, they, they, they used to transport the Jews from Birkenau, from Auschwitz, into the Reich, we were put into a camp called Ravensbrück, which was the only female, largest female concentration camp. And we stayed in Ravensbrück, as a matter of fact, until April 28th, 1945. And the strange thing was that by that time, the, the deportation was very calm and very quiet, and everybody was very considerate because the Allies and the Germans had made an arrangement. The Germans wanted their prisoners back. And the Allies said, we're not interested in having the, our prisoners because they're in POW camps and they're safe. We want the concentration camp prisoners and we want the women. And so the women in, in April 1945, must have been in the, from the beginning on, the women were brought, brought out with, with the Red, with Swedish Red Cross buses by nationalities. And by that time, my group, we were 15 people, 15 girls from, from Canada. There were 13 Slovaks, one Greek girl, and me. And we were waiting for the Slovaks to be in line to be deported, to be brought to Sweden. <laughs> but there was never the time for us, because by, I guess by, uh, gen, by uh, April 28th, Berlin was already, we could hear the, the artillery fire from Berlin, and uh, so we were put on the road again, and as I say, we were put very considerate, be careful, don't, don't stay back, if you stay back, the Russians will get you and they'll rape you. So we were all, they held us together, and interestingly enough, the three men from, from the three SS men from Canada sort of hovered over us, I don't know to this day why, but we, on, uh, I would say, the first thing we heard about Hitler being dead was on April 1st, while, while we were sitting on the road. At that time, all of Germany was fleeing, and we were just one of the crowds because, of course, we had taken off our numbers and we had a civilian closing. And uh, so but when, when this uh, motorcycle drove by and said, the Führer is dead, everybody was cheered and the bottle, and, came out, schnapps bottles, beer bottles, whatever, everybody was cheering. <laughs> and, but we were not free yet. We still had to walk off for about, about another two days. And we finally ended up running through, the last thing that I remember was running through an unplowed field because of, of artillery fire. And I don't know to this day whether it was the, the Russians, the Germans, the Allies, the Americans, who knows? It was artillery fire and we raced across and came to a little dusty country road, and we sort of stuck together, the 15th of us. And word of mouth came down from the front of this mile of people, and all of Germany was running to the liberation, to, to the Americans. And so word of mouth came down saying there's an American checkpoint. So we gathered together, and uh, we came to the checkpoint, and since I was the only one who spoke English, I walked up to, there were two GIs and a Jeep. We didn't, of course, we didn't know what a Jeep was. And there was a prisoner on the back sitting in a striped clothing. I guess he was their interpreter. 
And uh, I walked up to the GI and I said, uh, where are we supposed to go? And he looked at me. He says, you speak English. I said, yeah, why not? <laughs> and he said, well, you go back where you came from, maybe you'll learn English. And this prison, we, we of course, we rolled up our sleeves. Everybody, their 15 arms staring at him. And the guy in the back of this prison said, they can't go back where they came from. And the J.I. said, why not? And he said, they come from an extermination camp. And I have, will remember to the day of thy the look that the guy gave us and the, the prisoner in the back. And he said, what the hell is an extermination camp? And I, the only thing I could think of was, there was this youngster, was 24, 25, something like that, probably had been serving in the army since 41, perhaps, fighting to liberate the oppressed people of Europe. And he had no idea who the most oppressed people of Europe were. So he said, well, I don't know what to do with you. Go in that village, the town was called Rostov. The, our CO is in the, in the tavern there, that's at this headquarters. Maybe he'll know what to do with you. And so we uh, walked on this, gathered together and walked on that dusty country road. And all of a sudden I stopped and I thought of the date. It must have been about the 2nd or 3rd of May. And it was exactly so from 1942 to this day in 1945, May Day, that I had been without a guard, with a guard, and all of a sudden, I could walk, I could lay down, I could jump, I could do whatever I want to. I was free. I was liberated. Well, that was my moment of liberation. I frankly do not know how much time I've got left. <laughs> huh? Two minutes? Okay. <laughs> The two minutes we went into the tavern, there was the, the CO, and they took us in, and those, those 15 girls, they were, we were the, the, the freaks, because they had never heard of Auschwitz or of Birkenau. And the funniest thing was that I, while, while all the other girls were asleep in, in carts, they kept me awake and I had to tell the story since I was the only one who spoke English. But I'd like to leave you, all of you, young and old, with some thoughts. Please, remember one thing. All the people that, that uh, de developed the final solution were all of them highly educated. High, I mean, PhDs, doctors, journalists, the, the cream of the crop in SS uniforms. They were educated, but they had not one iota of humanity in them. And they were willing to use their education to pursue innocent human beings because of their religion, because they don't even call it a race. All of you have families, children, our children themselves still, probably some college kids here, don't ever forget what can happen if you are not thinking critically to anything that is presented to you. Be sure that you know what you people talk about. Be sure that it is not a swall of words that envelop them like it did the Nazis with Hitler. Because there was a, a writer that I had my, in my dissertation who once said in his, in his biography, I listened to Hitler and like all the others, I raised my hand. And then when I went home and I started to think, and I said, what the hell did he actually say? Mm -hmm. He didn't say anything. And that is it. what he spewed out was poison. And one of these days, let's be careful. It can happen anywhere. I'm afraid, my children call me paranoid. But I think I'm paranoid with good reason, because you have a right-wing push all over Europe, and it could catch us. Please, all of you, be critical of anything you hear. Don't let anybody envelop, in, envelop you in 
promises of a greater America, because you never know, that's what Hitler did too. <laughs> Promise a greater Germany. And do you, could we take a couple of questions? I know we're- running. I was wondering if you have time, I'll take questions, we're gonna yes. Take, we always want more time. We're gonna take maybe two questions and then uh, you all have cards. We have our new partnership with Charlotte Five. So um, if, your question, if you have questions and they haven't been answered, please write them down, hand them to, one, to me or one of our teammates and we'll um, go through them and some of them will be answered in, Char in the Charlotte Observer as well. So who has a question for Dr. Spatz? We have one back here. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna run it. Laura Neff, here you go, Laura. Thank you so much for being with us this morning. Um, stand up so you can see me. I'm so struck by your passion for keeping this history alive and sharing this story personally everywhere you go. And I'm curious, um, as the decades march on, what is your hope for how we can best remember without people to tell it to us firsthand 20 or 30 years from now? How can we best keep this alive so that it doesn't happen again? I'm going to say something that some people might not like, <laughs> but the American schools, and I'm not talking of colleges, but the American high schools need more history your children have no sense of history. I think that is one of the main things. And therefore, they're not interested in history. They're not interested in, they don't feel the danger. Because anybody who knows history knows that history will repeat itself because we don't give a damn to about what happened before. And we all repeat it. But if you have a sense of what happened before, you might think, to try to prevent it. And it's got to be prevented. That's the thing. Another question? One more question. Uh, so obviously Hitler made some really radical proclamations that were heinous. But you can't just show up one day and start saying things like that. So what was the steady drumbeat of conversation that was happening? How did it begin? Actually, it began with, with the, uh, the stock market crash here. Because the strange thing was that Germany, between oh, about 25 and 28, was beginning to really establish itself again. And the stock market crash did that, which gave hundreds of, of, of uh, uh, unemployed, uh, factories closing, etc., and having a man behind Hitler who, if he would have ever been on Madison Avenue, would have owned Madison Avenue, which was Joseph Goebbels. The man had a ability of persuading, of writing speeches for Hitler that roused the people up and made them believe that a greater Germany was possible. It, that's, that's all it takes. Advertisement, I'm afraid, is at the root of it all. Whether you call it Hitler, whether you call it uh, whoever he is on, on Madison Avenue. So reality, right? Resonance. Dr. Spatz, thank you so much. And like I mentioned, make sure you write your questions down and hand them to us. They will be answered in the Charlotte Observer in about 10 days from now. And we will see you next month, June 3rd. Our theme is Broken. Our speaker is Monty Montague. And our guest host is Jess George. Where's Jess? I know she's here. Jess! <laughs>